Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and I'm quite honored to be here to present the work of um, the MSF teams in Central African Republic, in Zemio, on the differentiated models of HIV care in conflict settings. Um, Zemio, as you see on the map, is located on the uh, southeast of the country. It has a HIV prevalence of uh, around 11.9 among sexual, uh, sexually active adults. And basically, this prevalence is quite higher than the national average, which is about 4.7. So MSF has been in Zemio since 2010 and initially was responding to uh, Congolese refugees that were actually running away from conflicts of rebels from Uganda. And basically, um, later, uh, MSF basically started an HIV program in 2011 to respond to the HIV prevalence. And in fact, um, just recently in December, MSF decided to leave. And the reasons for that is because of the increasing oppression volumes in the country. But it is very interesting in Central African Republic that um, the country has been actually going through chronic uh, wars, civil wars, since 2013. And these have had a major impact on the HIV programming in the country, uh, actually threatening, um, uh, actually posing a risk to patients in terms of treatment interruptions and also risking resistance. So um, we've adapted, actually, models of HIV care to try and uh, solve the problems that patients are facing in terms of uh, the, to solve the problems that patients are facing um, due to conflict, which actually risk um, the resistance that they can get. If you look at on the right here, um, we decided to actually implement two models of HIV care, <coughs> differentiated models of care. Uh, one is uh, pharmacy fast track and community art groups. Just to uh, explain in detail what pharmacy fast track is, basically pharmacy track refers to the appointment spacing and fast track of ALV refills. It simply means we've been giving patients either three or six months uh, ALT supply according to ease of reaching the clinic. And for community art groups, these are not new to MSF, and they are self-formed groups of patients on ALT living in the same geographical area. So um, why did we choose to implement uh, this innovation? Basically, the main reasons for implementing this innovation is basically to reduce the treatment interruptions and hence risk of developing resistance. And also we wanted to demonstrate feasibility that community art groups and pharmacy first track in this conflict setting. Um, as I said, CAGs are not new to MSF. The, in stable settings, they have demonstrated um, a lot of benefits, including reduced costs to patients and also reduced workload to healthcare workers. But we critically analyzed the negative, the factors that actually negatively influence the, uh, the uptake in those settings. And these are the ones that we capitalized when we were implementing this model. Especially uh, issues around um, those models in stable settings relying mainly on external factors. Uh, it is also stated that those models uh, did not really achieve to their capacity because they are not well promoted. So these are the, mainly the, the, the areas that we, we focused on when we are uh, uh, implementing these uh, models. So what are the main adaptations to CAGs that we apply to the conflict settings? We made sure that we give fewer medication pickups to patients. So we decided to split patients into geographical areas, and we gave three months, those that were living around the clinic and six months, those that were actually coming from far away. We made sure that we, we, we offer fewer consultations, basically one annual consultation versus monthly, which were implemented in stable settings. And we were very flexible when we were starting the groups in a way that we uh, included more patients to the groups, up to 30, as opposed to six uh, patients that were 
in, in each group in, 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 in previous CACs that were implemented. So we included all stable patients on antidotal treatment who are demonstrating good adherence and had also consented to join the, the groups. Uh, we also didn't exclude pregnant women and those that were under five. So how did we adapt this model to this conflict setting? So basically, uh, we promoted CAGs a lot in the beginning. And in fact, we used uh, a CAG leaflet that we implemented in the clinics, in the health facility. And it was translated in, all, in, three, in the three main languages. And later, actually, we also promoted CAGs <laughs> through community radios. Um, through clinic support, uh, through clinic support groups, we also try to uh, spread messages about CAGs to try and maximize the entry into CAGs. Uh, we simplified protocols and implementation tools. <coughs> Particularly, I think here the key tool that we used here was the activity chronogram, making sure that. We list all our activities that we wanted to implement in order to successfully um, uh, implement the program. Um, we chose among the patients community leaders that were, we trained so that they could facilitate um, all the community activities related to CAGs, such as um, organizing groups uh, in the communities, but also organizing those that were going to pick up drugs on a rotational basis. We realized that human resource was a key uh, limitation that we had in Zemio, because all the, all the workers that we were working with from the Minister of Health, they were less qualified, and in fact, they were not even enough. So what we decided was to integrate patients themselves into the program. So what we did through community leaders and through the groups that were existing, we selected members of the groups that were actually interested in volunteering and working in the clinics. So we chose specific areas such as um, the pharmacy, which was very key to the implementation of the model. And we actually recruited volunteers there and were very willing and working for free. And were distributing and packaging drugs. The other area that we capitalized on was also counseling. So we trained them in lay counseling so that they could also support those areas. Um, in December 2016, before we implemented these models, we did a kind of baseline analysis, and a total cohort of 1,658 patients were enrolled in the care, and out of which 86% were on antiretroviral treatment. 82% were active, and the cumulative mortality was 8%, and loss to follow-up was about 10%, giving a cumulative attrition of about 18%. If you can see, these results are not very different from those from stable countries. However, the team has been struggling with the problem of people actually coming late for appointments, uh, treatment interruptions, and also risking resistance because of uh, insecurity in the area, but also long distances. But patients have been making an effort to come, but sometimes they always come late. So looking at the data, interim data on these models, the CAGs and pharmacy first track, uh, between November and March 20, uh, 2017, a total of 1,070 patients, which are around 92% of those on art, had been enrolled in pharmacy first track. So the pharmacy first track actually was, a, we, we created it as a systemic kind of model, which was covering everyone, because it simply, uh, <coughs> made life quite flexible. Instead of coming every month to pick drugs, you could either come either three or six months. And then after that, we actually invited all the patients to join the CAGs from the pharmacy first track. And by March, 51% had formed uh, 58 CAGs. And each CAG had a median of 17 patients. So as I'm talking now, CAGs and pharmacy first track are still ongoing. So the enrollments uh, are still ongoing in the project. So the challenges included the growing insecurity in the area. So if you've heard about the news, there's already 
a major conflict which is very close to Zania in Bangasu. So that is actually threatening the future implementation of this model. Um, ensuring uninterrupted supply from Global Fund was also a major issue. Global Fund was issuing us drugs which were very uh, short half-life, so we couldn't distribute drugs for six months for patients. The frequent breakdown of gene expert, which limited uh, the implementation of point-of-care point viral load. This was also quite a limitation, and a high turnover nursing staff. So in the beginning, uh, all the experts actually were leaving when we were starting the model. So we had to have a gap of having a new nurse to come in. So in conclusion, therefore, uh, CAGS and Pharmacy First Track were able to be adapted in this conflict setting uh, and were well accepted by the population. MSF will continue to monitor this model for the coming two years, uh, basically looking at the impact on viral suppression and retention in care. The model is actually potentially replicable in the rest of the country, but also in similar settings. So I'd like to thank the MSF team, both in the project and headquarters, but also the Minister of Health and Patients. Thank you very much, Charles. So we have time for a few brief questions of technical clarification. We'll take a clutch, starting with Cecilia. Uh, thank you, Charles, for this fantastic presentation. Um, my question is, uh, you, you, are, you are explaining that you hand over the project to the Ministry of Health in December 2016. Um, the data you report is four months of implementation with great uh, results, a huge number of, of uh, CACs. Uh, but how, how, are, how are you going to monitor the, uh, the, the results if you are not anymore there? So that's the first question because we are facing the same problem in, in the northern part of the, of the country with the CACs. And the second question is if you have some qualitative uh, data about perception from patients of uh, being now detached from the hospital because in this setting for the last 10 years we have been provide very centralized approach. So do you have some of this uh, information? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, MSF has been in a phase of uh, actually, MSF is phasing out activities in Zemio. Uh, the activities being phased are not really HIV because we've negotiated to extend um, the phase out, but all the other activities started to phase out since December. Like the OPD, malaria, they have all closed. So actually we're supposed to close the whole project by May, but we've managed to negotiate to continue implementing CAGS until we enroll all the cohort into, into, into CAGS and groups. Um, for qualitative work, yes, MSF is gonna follow up this model for the next two years. In fact, it is still changing. The innovation is still changing because at the end of the year, if um, the plan is to close the base, and then we continue to monitor the model remotely uh, from the capital bank. So that would mean that MSF will continue to support with the drugs and we'll have the, the MOH and the patient in charge, but we'll have a remote nurse trying to monitor from uh, Bangi. Um, we'll continue to have uh, qualitative work, which has already started, because the LPs uh, have been in the, in the project to start up those activities, and also to train people that will continue to collect the data afterwards. So basically, all these activities will continue. The only limitation is uh, we are likely to continue these activities remotely.